Good morning again. So glad that you're here with us. My name is Tyler. I'm one of the associate priests here. I invite you to pray with me as we begin. Father, I pray that you send your spirit upon us, that what is spoken and what is heard might reveal to us your son, Jesus, and that through him we might ascend to you. We ask it in his name. Amen. Jesus Christ will come again to judge the living and the dead. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. We're in the middle of our summer preaching series through the Apostles' Creed, which is one of the oldest summaries of what Christians believe. And precisely because we say it so often in our weekly worship, it can become rote and automatic and perfunctory. So in this series, we're taking the time to consider each line of the Creed and ask of it, What if it's true? And if that's true, what's it mean for my life? Jesus Christ will come again to judge the living and the dead. There are three basic sections to the creed, and our line today is the last in the second section, which is all about Jesus, God the Son. And up until this week, we've been saying what we believe Jesus did. It's all past tense. He was born, he did die, he was raised, etc., Some people don't believe these things about Jesus. Christians do. But this week, the creed turns to the future with a single line. And it's interesting that to be a Christian is to believe one fundamental thing about the future. There's lots I don't know. Almost all of it I don't know. I don't know if things are going to get better or worse, what countries and empires will rise and fall. I'm not a fortune teller. I don't know what's going to happen in the future except this one essential thing that one day there will be no more future, and that day he will come again to judge the living and the dead. Some of you might be starting to feel a little bit squirmy in your pew right now. Like maybe you imagine yourself to be a reasonable, respectable person, and you're starting to think of all the other things you could have done with a perfectly nice Sunday morning instead of listen to some bald lunatic come about the second talk about the second coming of Jesus. And fair enough, if you're feeling that way, I guarantee you are not alone. Because maybe you think that Jesus was an important spiritual teacher with good things to say about love and God and stuff. And, and maybe you even believe that his death brings forgiveness for us. And maybe, maybe you even believe that he was raised from the dead and ascended into heaven. You can build a workable faith with that, Right? Like, here's God become man, teaches us how to live, gives us spiritual power to live the lives we're supposed to, and then goes to heaven and leaves us to do the job. But even if you believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus, I just want to acknowledge here that it can still feel like a struggle to grapple with this final peace. He will come again to judge the living and the dead because it's been so long. And what would that even look like? Like what, you're watching the news someday and some reporter is going to be like, stay tuned, I've got uh, live footage uh, for our breaking story that Jesus is back. And all of a sudden, life looks like a Kirk Cameron movie. That's a deep cut for my evangelicals out there. And yet, if you're building a Christian faith, you cannot get away from the second coming of Jesus. You cannot ignore it. It's right there in the creed. And it's in the creed because it's all throughout the Bible. Like in the Gospels, Jesus talks about his return all the time. And to listen to what he says about love and justice, but dismiss what he says about his return, it's a little rude, don't you think? Listen, here's what I want for you this morning. I want you to know what this belief about the future can mean for your faith. And that means being set free from worry about the mechanics of Jesus' return, what it's going to look like, or the timing, when it's going to happen. The simple fact is that nobody knows anything about either of those things. Hear me very clearly on this. For 2,000 years, there's been no shortage of Christians who are willing to speculate with great authority about the second coming of Jesus, and so far, every single prophecy expert has been wrong. And this is because that sort of speculation, when's he coming back, what's it going to look like, is not the point of saying you believe in Jesus' return. 
the point of saying he will come again to judge the living and the dead, the purpose of our belief about the future is to anchor and define our present. And what I want for you this morning, by the time we're through here, is to have a sense of how the truth of this belief, because it is true, he will come again to judge the living and the dead, how that truth can give your life integrity and purpose in the here and now. If you feel unsettled to think about Jesus coming back, it may be somewhat reassuring to you that doubt and uncertainty about his second coming is as old as the church itself. Our reading from 1 Thessalonians this morning is one of the oldest documents in the collection of letters and gospel biographies that makes up the Christian New Testament. It's a letter from the missionary church planter Paul, from whom this church takes its name, to the church that he'd set up in Thessalonica, today the second largest city in Greece. It's probably written about around AD 50, about two decades after Jesus' death and resurrection. The Jesus movement that was spreading around the Mediterranean was barely a generation old. But the passing of a generation meant that those, some of those first followers of Jesus were dying of old age or illness or whatever. And this made those Christians nervous because they expected Jesus to have like, come back by now. All the other things he'd said would come to pass. Those came true quickly. He said, I'm going to get killed. I'm going to uh, be raised again from the dead. I'm going to go to heaven. I'm going to send the Spirit. All that happened within two months, but not his return. So now it's been two decades, and if Jesus hasn't come back yet, what do they do with these believers who are dying without seeing the age to come that Jesus talked about? Are they going to miss it? And it's been 20 years, Paul. Is Jesus actually even coming back? These are the questions that the Thessalonian Christians are asking, and the section of the letter we heard this morning that Aaron read for us is Paul responding. In the passage we heard, Paul makes two basic points to encourage the church. Encourage, he says it twice. In 4.13 to 18, he reassures the Thessalonians that those who have died will not miss out on Jesus' return. And in 5.1 to 11, he reminds them what it means to live without knowing precisely when Jesus is coming back. Notice what Paul says at the start of his first point in 4.13. He says, I don't want you to grieve like people who have no hope, which is to say, grieve like pe those who believe the dead are gone forever. And basically, Paul's saying, don't you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Because if you believe this, he says, then you can know that the God who gives life can restore, the God who gives life can restore it. The resurrection's proof of that. But what the second coming of Jesus means, he will come to judge the living and the dead, what it means really means is that he's in charge of everything. Not just those people who are alive when he decides to show up, but all the dead as well. Prime ministers and presidents have no authority over dead citizens. Death is escape from their law, but Jesus has that authority. And sit with this for a second. Because if Jesus will come to judge the dead, then that means that nothing and no one is ever truly lost. And this is both wonderful and terrifying. History textbooks make us feel like we know the past, but the fact is that basically all of human history, all of human experience is lost to us. We don't remember most of what we do, feel, and think. What did you do, feel, and think yesterday? Could you give me a second-by-second second account of it? Let alone the deeds and feelings of thoughts of the billions of people who lived and who are now dead. But when we say that Jesus will come again to judge the living and the dead, we're declaring, in effect, everything matters. There will be an accounting, a reckoning for everything, and I mean everything, Justice that so often feels delayed or denied will finally come, but not just for the big stuff of history, the Holocaust, slavery, the cultural genocide of indigenous peoples, but for every small movement of every human heart that has ever beat and every wayward thought of every human mind that has ever sparked, every mortal sin, every petty grievance, 
everything that falls short of the perfect love of God for God's creation in every human being that has ever lived, everything that is lost to us has poured into the fathomless, infinite memory of God, and the Lord Jesus Christ will be judge over all of it. It's simply staggering to consider. It's too overwhelming. The weight of humankind. And what it means for me and for you, on a granular level, is that our lives are barreling headlong toward the judgment of God. And I'm talking about your life in all its fullness, not just your big successes that put you stuff, you put, the stuff you put on your resume or, or your failings, but the completeness of who you are, the motions of your heart and the thoughts that nobody else will ever know. These aren't incidental, they aren't insignificant. All of who you were and are and will be, all of it ends before the judgment seat of God. And I'll tell you what, that makes my heart beat faster just to say. Like I'm breathing a little faster right now. Because it makes me afraid. Not in like a horror movie kind of way, but just in sort of an existential awe. To imagine my life held before the all-consuming fire of God who is love immolating everything that is not love. In my mind's eye, it's like a mote of dust floating into the sun, except I'm smaller than the dust and God is bigger than the sun. It's the idea that I matter, that you matter. You matter to God. Matter enough to be judged, weighed, held to account. It's far more terrifying than the idea that we simply vanish when we die. And the core of the Christian hope, the only thing I can cling to as a Christian, is that at the center of that consuming fire is the man, Jesus Christ, ascended to heaven, seated at the right-hand side of the Father. The core of the Christian hope is that we know the heart of the judge. Our judge does not disdain to become human for our sake. Our judge did not refuse the humiliation of the cross. Our judge lives and will never die. Our judge loves for us. Our judge was the one who decided that we should be forgiven. This is why scripture says that our one boast, our one hope is Jesus Christ crucified and raised. Says that whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. None of us is righteous enough to face that judgment. Not you, not me. Only Jesus was. And the Christ who died for us, who knows our weaknesses, is the one who died so that we could be forgiven. What do you do with that? How do you live with the immensity of it? Because if you believe it, we're all headed toward a judgment that we have no capacity to bear, a judgment where our only hope is that we know the identity and the heart of the judge and on the one hand, there's like nothing I can do to get ready for that. You know, like a self-improvement program where I'll be like, I've got a little more confidence headed into that. But on the other, it, it also doesn't feel light to, right to treat it light, lightly, like, oh, it's Jesus' job to forgive me, so, you know, I'll live how I want. If you think this future is true, how does it change your present? In the second section of the First Thessalonians reading, Paul is telling the Thessalonians what it means to live in the anticipation of Jesus' coming. And the whole point, he says, is that nobody knows when it's going to happen. That thing that's driving you crazy, like, when's he coming, is actually necessary. Because to live in anticipation of Jesus' coming and the judgment is to live with sobriety and vigilance. Think about it. If you knew the end was happening imminently, you'd go into frantic activity. Like when there was that false alert a few years back that North Korea had launched a nuclear missile at Hawaii and everybody in Hawaii got a text message from the state alerting them to this and for a hot half hour they all thought they were going to die. Panic. Conversely, if you could know for sure that the end was thousands of years away, you'd get complacent because nobody starts preparing for landing right after the plane takes off. You know that you've got a journey ahead of you. You break out your book. You 
yet you're moving. But we don't know, Paul says. When the day comes, it'll come like a thief. So what do you do? You live as people who watch. We're not like people of the night, Paul says, who get drunk and sleep. We're people of the day. We are awake and alert. We are ready. And the problem with this is that watching is hard. Readiness is hard. Because you can't clench a muscle forever. And I will be honest, with 2,000 years of waiting, it is hard for me really and truly to imagine that today is going to be the day that I turn on CNN and there's Jesus showing up when the present age turns into the age to come. I have a hard time imagining it. So how do you do it? What do you do? The only way is to take eternity one day at a time. The end of the world, the coming judgment of Jesus, could, it could be tomorrow or it could be in a million years. I don't know. That's an impossible thing to consider and to hold on to. But my own end, my own death, is much easier to grasp because it's coming. Probably not today or tomorrow, I hope, but it could soon, relatively speaking. I turned 45 last month. I appreciate everyone who's quietly surprised. Thank you for that. My eldest daughter and I were at the grocery store on my birthday, and I got asked proof for proof of age, and I was like, she's right there, and she's eight years old. Um, I've got reasonably long-lived genes, but the odds are that there's less earthly time in front of me than there is behind me. And the thing is, uh, for each of us, there's actually not a meaningful difference between our own death and the second coming of Jesus, because as far as we're concerned, they're proximate. I end my time among the living, I wake to the judgment of God. That's this time that I've got until I die, however long it is, that's all of my time. No do-overs. And it's possible, I think, to live vigilantly and soberly with the time we've got precisely when we know that each day could be our last. Could be. That's the point. You can't live every day as if it's your last. Not really. It's wildly irresponsible. And if you live your life as, it, as if it will never end, that's complacently irresponsible. But it could be. Today could be. Probably not. But could be. Today could be the day I come before the judgment of Jesus, living or dead. There's a little devotional book called St. Augustine's Prayer Book, and before they revised it, it had this meditation at the beginning. It's called Remember Christian Soul. If you want to look it up online, or you, if, you, if you like it, you can shoot me an email and I'll send it to you, or we'll link to it in the video notes. It strikes right at the heart of what I'm trying to say here. And perhaps you could print it up and read it to yourself in the morning, or, or just touch base throughout the day as a way of holding to this watchfulness. It says, remember, Christian soul, that you have this day and every day of your life, God to glorify, Jesus to imitate, a soul to save, a body to mortify, sins to repent of, virtues to acquire, hell to avoid, heaven to gain, eternity to prepare for, time to profit by, Neighbors to edify, the world to despise, devils to combat, passions to subdue, death perhaps to suffer, judgment to undergo. How do you live in anticipation of Jesus' return? One day at a time. Each day its own complete work of spiritual labor. And to live like this with a watchful attentiveness to your own finitude as a way of taking account of the finitude of all things, is to live with the quiet and calm responsibility that reflects the weight and the worth of the life that you've been given, the price that Jesus paid for you on the cross, the accounting to which we are all destined. Because if you live like this, even if the day of Jesus' return is, chronologically speaking, a million years away, existentially speaking, spiritually speaking, that day is now for you. If you live with this in mind, it'll change how you go through your day because to live every day remembering that today you may meet God is to live in reliance on that God, asking for help and grace to turn toward God and away from the sin that comes so naturally to us. 
you'll keep shorter accounts with each other and God. If today might be the day you meet God, you can't nurture one more day that simmering grudge against your family member. And if there's something amiss in your spiritual life, you won't put off fixing it. There's less time for trivialities, the feed, the scrolling, the gossip, less temptation by the lure of earthly success like fame or wealth. You'd be less dazzled by youth and beauty and other passing things. You'd be gentler, kinder, and more patient, all things that I routinely fail at. And when the day is over, it's over. All that's done is done. What's been left undone will be left undone. And your watchfulness is over. And you get a rest. And you pray that you see another sunrise to start your watch anew. Another day when Jesus Christ will come again to judge the living and the dead. Amen.